Welcome to the Worship Leader Coaching Podcast, helping you go from leading songs to leading people. I'm your host, Caleb Holgerson. On this show, I talk with local church worship leaders about worship, leadership, creativity, and teamwork. We believe that by working together and learning from each other, we can build worshiping churches that are passionate about the presence of God. Let's get started. Well, y'all, today I'm here with Matt Stinton, the songwriter's advocate, to talk about songwriting and uh, worship songwriting and, you know, talk a little bit about some um, really practical tips, practical advice for songwriters, because it's something that a lot of us just kind of jump into without really any knowledge of how to write a good song. We just we just start trying. And so Matt's going to give us some advice on maybe how to shape those up a little bit. Matt, how are you, man? Thanks for joining me. Hey, man, doing great. Thanks for having me. Happy Absolutely. to be here. I'm always happy to talk songwriting. Yes. Yeah, so good to have you. Well, before we jump in, you know, too deep into songwriting and everything that that entails, why don't you give us just, you know, uh, a little bit about you and kind of what you do and uh, talk about the songwriter's advocate, all of that. Yeah. Well, uh, I've been songwriting since I was a kid. I, I wrote my first song when I was six, actually. Nice. And, was it any uh, good? Uh, you know, I mean, it was not bad for a kid, I guess. Not <laughs> yeah, bad for yeah. six years old. <laughs> I mean, you know, was, I was six, though. So. Well, sure, sure. Yeah, it wouldn't be a, wouldn't be a chart topper, that's for sure. <laughs> but uh, started writing, you know, when I was a kid like that. I mean, I probably really fell in love with songwriting in my teenage years. Uh, I really got into 90s pop. I have a big, nice. a big sweet spot for who's, 90s who's, pop. who's the favorite? Uh, or man, top three? You know. Top three, Third Eye Blind, yeah. Goo Goo Dolls. Yes. Ooh, I mean, those are definitely top two. There's a handful yes. of other bands that I, I love too, you know, Vertical Horizon, oh, yeah. Union of Souls. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of great lot Oops. of really great music. Some of the best. Here. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So it was during that time that I kind of fell in love with songwriting. Like I loved, loved music so much that I, I just couldn't, I was constantly listening to music. And then I was constantly taking those songs and figuring out how to play them on the piano and mm -hmm. you know all that stuff. And so it was really just the time I fell in love with music, you know, did songwriting, you know, it's really pretty pretty heavily from that point forward and you know played it just kind of typical story played in bands in high school played in bands in college yeah. and ended up uh out at bethel in oh, 2009 cool. and got involved with bethel music a couple years after that very which cool was a lot of fun so i was out there part of that crew songwriting worship leading uh you know the whole deal touring traveling recording it was um, an amazing time. I bet. Did that, yeah, did that for a few years. And now um, out here in Portland, Maine, uh, on staff at a church here with my wife and Very friends cool. and uh, you know, worship pastors here. And then I started the Songwriters Advocate, uh, which is the online songwriting school that I run for songwriters and worship leaders. I uh, started that in a little over, a little over a year ago now, maybe a year cool. and a half. So been a lot of been a lot of fun awesome yeah i've been following you since uh, pretty early on i think i you know um and I, I i love the stuff that you're you're putting out at least on on instagram where i where i hang out and and, and watch yeah. you uh, appreciate what you do um but let's let's dive into that a little bit about kind of songwriting and what you do you know to help songwriters so totally. um kind of the first question i have for you and really this is all just Try, me trying to get free advice from you, but um, <laughs> yeah. Um, when you sit down to write a song, where do you start? I think that's a big question that a lot of worship leaders that I run into that want to write for their church or even just want to write for their own enjoyment, they run into, they go, I, I just don't know where to begin. Do I start with a lyric? Do I start with a melody? Do I start with, you know, just playing chords on the guitar, all of the above? Where do you begin? You know, I would say this is the like hands down the most common question I get asked. Wow. And you know, do you do I start with lyrics first? Do I start with melody first? And me being the super helpful guy that I am, I say, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you start with the lyrics first. Do you start with the melody first? <laughs> you really you start with what you get. Yeah. And I think that a lot of times, you know, 
starting a song, especially as a new songwriter, starting a song can be really overwhelming because we don't really know, you know, we don't know where to start. We don't know if there's a right way to do things and a wrong way to do things. And so we can you know, kind of overthink things. Sure. And the more that we overthink things, the less likely we are to actually write something because mm. we're going to spend our time thinking about writing instead of just writing and spending yeah. all of our creative energy on, you know, am I doing this right? Right. And then, uh, well, technically you're not doing it right because you're you're worrying instead of right. writing. So no. Right, right. But you, you, the best place to start a song is is you start with whatever you get. And that's different for every songwriter. Some people always get melodies first. Mm -hmm. Some people always get lyrics first. For me, I usually get a line with a melody at the same time. And then I have to build everything else around it. Mm -hmm. But it, it really is different uh, than, than every, you know, for every person. And uh, one of my friends, Christine DeMarco, I remember her talking about songwriting once. She's actually almost every school, every round of school that that we do with the Songwriters Advocate. She's one of our guest speakers, which oh, is wow. awesome. And she's talked before about, she put a picture, she sat down with a picture in front of her at her piano. Mm -hmm. And she just looked at that picture and she used that as inspiration. And that's kind of how, how she wrote a hmm. song one. And I think it's just not at all what I have done. I don't know if that would work for me or not, but it's what she did and it's what worked for her. Yeah. And so really starting with what you get, whatever yeah. works for you is that's what you should be doing. Mm. That's good. That makes a lot of sense. Well, so say you come up with, you know, you have a, a, a lyric idea or a melody idea or whatever. Yeah. Um, how do you know that that's like strong enough? You know, does that question make sense? Like, how do you know yeah. if you can get something else out of that. Yeah. I mean, this is where some of the, uh, this is where understanding the way that creativity works is, is so important mm -hmm. uh, because you're uh, like the short and short and sweet of it is, is that if you, the, the more that you criticize what you're doing, the less your creative, the creative parts of your brain are actually functioning They've done some studies and they've they've seen that they figured out that the the parts of your brain that handle creativity and the parts of your brain that handle like criticism like self monitoring uh, don't work very well at the same time. Hmm. And so one of the best things that you can do is to not worry about if what you're writing is good and just to write mm -hmm. because it's more important. This is what I tell my students all the time. It's better to write a bad song than to write no song at all. Yeah. Because at least if you wrote a bad song, you can figure it out and, you know, see this is what I like about it, this is what I don't like about it, and you can fix it. Right. Or if you write a bad song and it's just bad all around, you don't want to fix it, you don't have to show anybody. Right. Right? <laughs> you can just throw that song away and move on. Right. Yep. But I think we can get really hung up on is this good enough? And we really what we're wanting to know is am I good enough? That's what we're, that's the real question that we're trying to answer. Uh, am I going to be safe if I show this to somebody or am I going to get made fun of? Are they going to think that I'm no good? And that's really what mm -hmm. we're trying to answer mm -hmm. when we think, is this good enough? And I think it's mm -hmm. actually just really important for us to, to just not worry about if it's good or not. And it's better to just write yeah. and to not worry about good or bad because good is so subjective. Right. If I were to ask you, what's a great song? And you were to tell me, that, you know, this is a song I think is really great. I may not agree. Right. But you may love that song and I may hate that song. Right. So is it good? Well, it's good to you and it's not right. good to me. So that's so. But who's right? Right. Doesn't matter. It's subjective. Right, right. And so a lot of times, you know, we have to really be we got to be mindful of you know, where we're at as a songwriter. Mm -hmm. One of the most important things that we can do is to not compare ourselves to other people's songs, because mm -hmm. if we're comparing our songs and we're brand new writers and we're comparing our songs to, you know, the Jeremy Riddles of the world mm -hmm. who are, you know, great songwriters and you hear, uh, you know, you look at their songs and you think my song's not like that. Well, 
that's not a fair comparison for you because right. Jeremy and these writers have been writing for so long and they're further along in their craft. They're further along in their, you know, in life and their experience. And so when you compare yourself, your songs mm -hmm. with somebody else's songs, that's not actually a fair comparison. Mm -hmm. The only real fair comparison that you can do is you can compare your songs with your songs. Mm -hmm. Your songs now with your songs before, mm -hmm. that's how you can tell if you're actually growing in your craft, yeah. but to compare your songs, you know, and say like, well, it's not as good as that song. So it's not good. It's like, well, you have to start somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. And well, if you don't value where you start, you'll never end up somewhere good because you're just going to criticize yourself the whole way along. Yeah. We'll talk about kind of evaluating your songs a little bit. I had a couple of questions before that on the list that I sent you, but I, I think we're there. Like how, uh, how can you com compare your songs, you know, to each other to kind of, um, uh, effectively do that and to, to improve, like what, what are you looking for when you're evaluating a, a, a song that you wrote or, um, or even that a student wrote or something? Yeah. Well, here's what I'm looking for. And I think this is a great, uh, a great thing for, uh, songwriters who are really trying to grow in their craft, like for them to kind of catalog and like hear some thing, pract very practical things. I'm mm -hmm. a super practical kind of person. And uh, a couple, a couple of things that come to mind, like one of the big ones for me is I'm looking for a song that's about one thing. Right. And that's a, a problem that I see a lot of songwriters, you know, just, just a sign of inexperience in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. that they will write a song about two or three or four different mm -hmm. topics and without realizing that they're doing that. Right. So you can put words on a page that rhyme, but that doesn't mean your song is saying anything. Right. It might just be words on a page that rhyme. Right. And so I'm looking for, if, if I, like, this is like, this is a really helpful question for the songwriters out there. Ask yourself, what am I trying to say? Mm. That is a, really big, really, really important question, but it's a really simple thing that if you can answer that, you just make sure that your song all finds a way to tie into that. Right. And so, I mean, you want to, if you have a song that's about multiple themes, like it's got multiple, multiple things it's talking about, uh, it actually is like listening to, uh, to someone ramble. You ask them a question and they say like 30 things, mm -hmm. but none of them are about the question that you asked. Mm -hmm. It's like a political press conference, right? right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they find their way to weave around and never quite answer the question. And that's the, uh, that, that when a song doesn't have a clear message, people don't actually know what's being said. Right. And so that's one thing that I'm looking for. And I think well, a great tool for songwriters to assess the songs that they're writing is to say, did I write about one thing or did I write about more than one thing? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like, What's the heartbeat of the song? What am I trying to say? And then you can look at it and say, well, what I really want people to know is that God's love is bigger than any thing they could ever face. Right. So that's the heartbeat of my song. But over here, I'm talking about you know, the mercy and then, and he, this section I'm talking about surrender. Mm -hmm. So you have to say, does this actually work together thematically or did they just rhyme or did it right. just, is that just what came out? And that happens all the time. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, this is a little, you know, a pro tip. If you are looking through one of your songs and you realize my chorus is about one thing, my verse is about another, but I love both of them. Guess what? You have two songs now. Right, right. So you can take those two things and say they're not about the same thing. I like that they go and like I wrote them to go together, but they actually don't go together. But now I have two songs started. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty cool because now you've got two songs instead of one. Right. And that that's what happens uh, often. Uh, so that's one one big thing for me is like that's one thing I'm looking for. Yeah. Uh, the second thing that I'm looking for is uh, musical diversity. Mm. So I want to make sure that there's distinction between the sections. Uh, another thing that I see a lot of younger songwriters do is they will write all, you know, sections of their song, verse, chorus, and bridge, and they all sound alike. Gotcha. And that 
takes a little bit of, you know, I talk about musical intuition all the time because everyone's mm -hmm. musical intuition is a little different. Um, one person would say, you know, I would, I want to change this melody here this way. And the next person would uh -huh. change it a different way. And again, this stuff is really subjective. Right. But there's also an element of musical uh, intuition that gets developed. And your intuition mm -hmm. is the thing that as you develop that and you listen to melodies, I mean, this is what I tell people, go listen to songs that you love and listen to how they wrote the melody. You'll hear, you know, the sections don't sound alike. You have mm -hmm. low sections, you have high sections, you've got pretty much every song has the epic, like top, the, right. the most climactic section. Uh, and that melody is typically higher up on the scale. Like I'm looking for sections that are lower on the scale and sections that are higher on the scale. Mm -hmm. And so I think those, those are two things that are, are simple, uh, simple ways that people can actually, uh, look at their songs and see if they're, uh, see if they are, you know, doing a good job with it. And, uh, one of the, actually there's, there's something that I offer, um, for anybody who's, you know, I have a, I'm stammering a little bit. I got a free guide is what I'm trying to say. Okay. You go to okay. uh, the songwriters advocate.com slash five steps. Okay. Uh, and if you go there, you can get a, a free guide called how to write better songs in five steps. Hey. And it has tips like this in it, talking about writing one thing. Here's how you write a better melody. And it's a quick start guide for people who are trying to grow in their craft, but people awesome. can actually use that to assess the songs that they're writing now. Mm -hmm. as well as songs that they're going to write in the future. It'll help as a guide for that. Awesome. I'll link that in the show notes. So if you're listening, uh, definitely look in the notes for that. Um, go get that guide and it'll shape up your songs a little bit. That's it. Uh, so uh, do you have any, so it, on the um, differentiating between sections, yeah. you see you're talking about, uh, is that as simple as, um, you know, singing your chorus an octave up or like what, give me some, some really practical, you know, pieces there for, for, for changing those. Because I actually, I always, I start out a lot of songs that way where it, I don't know if that sounds the same and I have to go, okay, what can I do? I was working on a song yeah. today where I had to go, well, what can I do? Cause these are just the same uh, level the whole time. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah. What, give me, give me some things to try with that. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's one of those things that you, the more that you listen for it, uh -huh. uh, the easier it is to actually to, to write that way. Mm. And so that's why I'm always sending people, hey, go listen to this song, listen to that song, see how they actually do it. Uh, it's, it literally is as simple as uh, you is, you know, you think about the note, the range of notes that, that you're singing. Mm -hmm. So if you're singing mm -hmm. your verse, you know, you know, somewhere through there, <laughs> you want to take it into your chorus where your chorus goes, da, 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 da. you know, it's an, it's mm -hmm. an, uh, it's an mm -hmm. actual lift, it's a, lift. Uh, a lift up the scale. Gotcha. And if you need, you know, people need help doing that, literally just sit down uh, on your instrument. Mm -hmm. If you have one, and listen to the range, mm -hmm. find the notes that you're singing mm -hmm. on that scale, and then count a few up okay. and uh, and start there. Uh, there's something, I have a friend who calls it the money note. And it is, if you're, for those uh, people who are, you know, into music theory, mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the one or it's the eight. So uh -huh. you're, you go up the scale. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And so the one and the eight are an octave. And if you listen to how many songs uh, the chorus starts on that money note or mm -hmm. hangs around that money note, it's that eight, mm -hmm. that top note. You'll, you'll. That's a great place to start a chorus in the in that mm -hmm. range because a lot of modern music is is written that way to to hang around mm -hmm. that note. So if you think of it that way, you know, you write your verse in the like, you know, one through five, one through six range, and you start mm -hmm. your chorus up around that eight range, mm -hmm. like that, that's a really practical way to do it. 
Uh, another way is also just to think of, this is something actually from the guide. So here's a little preview, yeah. but you, you think about writing your, your melodies like a house. Okay. So you're going to have a section that's going to be your foundation. Mm -hmm. These are the lowest notes, uh, the lowest notes in the song, actually okay. lower on the scale. Okay. That is going to be your, your foundation. Usually it's your verse. Uh -huh. And you're going to have a main floor, so it's going to come up the scale from the foundation into your main floor, which is typically your chorus. Uh -huh. So and uh, that's, I mean, some people will reverse this with the next section, mm -hmm. uh, which is the the roof of the house. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, for me, I always, I almost always write it. So my bridge mm -hmm. is often that the bridge is going to be the roof of my house. It's the sure. highest point in the song physically it's the highest notes and it's typically uh the biggest section like the most climactic section of the song as well and gotcha. some people uh some people will reverse those and they want their sure. you know, the bridge is going to be you know it's going to be lower and they want their chorus to be their main section but i always tell people you probably want at least two of these sections in in your song otherwise it's going to be it's going to lack some dynamics because when you're yeah. writing a melody you just got to remember bringing notes up mm -hmm. creates energy, bringing notes down resolves energy. Mm -hmm. So you start low when you, if you, why is it that when we are singing these songs and we get from the low verse and we start singing actually actual higher notes in the chorus that we feel the energy of the song shift? Right. It's because you bring notes up, it creates energy. You bring the melody down and it reduces energy. Gotcha. So that's why having those distinction, like the distinction between the sections is, is so important. Gotcha. Uh, do you have any thoughts on writing singable melodies? Cause I mean, the people that are listening to us today are, are worship songwriters primarily. Yeah. So they're writing for their church, you know, congregational melodies that everybody can sing along to. Mm -hmm. uh, now uh, for me personally, like when I'm choosing, you know, the key of a song, I'm not necessarily key wise. I'm not necessarily concerned about the congregation sure. um, because they sing along with Taylor Swift on the radio. They can sing, sing along with me. And that's kind of how I right. go with that. You know, you, you and Taylor have the same range. Right, basically, <laughs> basically. Um, but, but as far as melodies go, that could get tricky sometimes. Or I know people that are primarily vocalists that are always trying to do funky things vocally that it's hard, you know, for a congregation to sing along with. Um, so you have any thoughts on that? On just, you know, stuff that's singable, easy for congregations? Yeah, well, there's, it's kind of hard to describe what a singable melody is. It's true. Like it really in depth because, you know, when you hear it, you hear it, you know it, but here's yeah. the reason singability is, is super important because if you, if you think about it, what you're writing, you, you're writing for the purpose of having people sing, right? right. Like so right. if you're writing a worship song, the point is to have people sing it. Yeah. And if they aren't singing it, well, that's a bummer because yeah. like, if they're not able to sing it, then that's kind of defeating the purpose of, of why you wrote the song in the first place. Right. And so the average person in your congregation is going to be not super musical. Yeah. They may be able to I'd say most people can carry a melody. Mm -hmm. You have some people who, you know, can't carry a tune in a bucket, as they right. say. Right. And there are some people that are really, you know, solid singers that'll be mm -hmm. out there. But your average person is not super musical. So the mm -hmm. more confusing and inconsistent your melody is, the harder it is for uh, for people to sing along mm -hmm. with you because they're going to just try to figure out, you know, what the heck are we singing right now? I can't even keep up with, with what's going on mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the melody is hard to sing along to. It's got super low notes and super high notes and there's no mm -hmm. consistent patterns and you know, all of that, just the same way that, uh, well, you know, in the same way that you, you know, want a singable melody, like a big aspect of, of a singable melody is having those, is having like a consistent pattern, which, you know, this is, mm -hmm. this is getting into really, you know, more technical, more technically, uh, sure. minded, 
and uh, songwriting. This is some of the stuff that we we cover in the class. But really, you, you want to have those melodies that have some repetition to them, mm-hmm. uh, because if they're all over the place, no one's going to remember mm-hmm. how to sing mm-hmm. it. It's confusing. It's hard to remember, and that is not a win as a songwriter. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That it reminded me of a question that I didn't send you, but I uh, want to ask: How important is like um, syllable count to you? Like, you know, if I'm matching the syllable count in verse one and verse two, mm-hmm. or uh, is that something that you know? I, I know some songwriters that, writers that are really hard on that, and some songwriters that are like, yeah, I could go either way. Um, and that kind of goes along with what you were just saying with yeah. the you know repetition and the you know being able to remember it. How important is that? Pretty darn, I would okay. say. It, it depends. Uh, it depends, I think, on the ultimate purpose of your song. Mm-hmm. Uh, in my opinion, if you're writing like singer songwriter kind of stuff, you mm-hmm. can get away with more mm-hmm. uh, than you can get away with if you're writing corporate worship. Mm-hmm. But the the less consistent your syllable count is, like whatever the pattern that you have created uh, with your meter, mm-hmm. which is you know another for the poetry people out there, you know you've got right. your your meters, so how many syllables you have in your lines and all that. Mm-hmm. Uh, the the more corporate you want to be, the more consistent it needs to be, mm-hmm. because you're teaching people how to sing your song, mm-hmm. and if you go and you add a bunch of extra syllables in, uh, it can make it awkward to sing. Mm-hmm. And there are, there are times where, you know, songwriters can get really creative with the way that they shove extra syllables in <laughs> that, like, I, I've, you know, I've heard the songs where, you know, a student is, has shoved way too many syllables into a line that I can't even sing it back. Right. And I'm, I'm pretty, you know, this is, I do this pretty regularly. And I think this is like, can you sing that section again? Okay. One more time. Uh, okay, well, you know, then I say let's let's just simplify this a little bit because sure. you don't realize you may have not realized that you've got an extra like four syllables crammed into this line mm-hmm. where mm-hmm. you your pattern that you've set up, let's say you've got, you know, 10 syllables, 12 syllables, 10 syllables, 12 syllables. So mm-hmm. those are your 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 four line verse, let's say, and mm-hmm. you've got one that goes 10 16 mm-hmm. in, instead of 12. 10, 12. Well, that 16 line is going to be hard to sing and people aren't going to necessarily remember uh, how to sing it because mm-hmm. it's awkward because it's shoved. You you have the pattern. Sorry, my dog's in here. Oh, that's right. You heard that? <laughs> yeah. uh, if you, if you're, you've written a pattern that's made for 12 syllables and right. you're trying to fit a 16 syllable you know, word count into a line that's made for 12 is just not going to work. So mm-hmm. I, I'm, a, I think there's, there's room for wiggle here and there. Mm-hmm. Uh, so sometimes it, it just works, mm-hmm. but normally for wiggle, I mean, I'm thinking like usually one syllable right, or two. Right. So yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, how do you know uh, when a song's done, when it's ready for, uh, the worship service or the the gig or to record or whatever else. Um, yeah. <laughs> Again, it can be really <laughs> subjective. Um, when we were recording the album, uh, We Will Not Be Shaken, mm-hmm. we're writing for that album uh, mm-hmm. with Bethel Music. I have a song on that album called Who Can Compare to You? And mm-hmm. when that song went out, uh, I wasn't done. I wasn't done with it. But the higher ups said, hey, actually, we're really happy with where the song is. We think it's done. And I mm-hmm. said, you know, I'd like to work on it more. And they said, uh, well, it's time. It's time. <laughs> it's done. We like it. We don't think you need to work on it anymore. We're really right. happy with where it is. And so, out, you know, out the door it went. I wasn't done with it, but they were happy with it. Mm-hmm. And I think this is where, you know, we have to, you know, if we know the things to look for, Mm-hmm. Like, did I write about one thing? Mm-hmm. Do I have distinction in my sections? Mm-hmm. Do I have any lines that stand out to me as being just really off topic or, mm-hmm. you know, li- a line that I just don't like? Mm-hmm. You know, if we know how to look for those things and 
you know, we, that will help us kind of figure out a little better Mm -hmm. if, if it's done, but it is very, it's very much, you know, subjective because, you know, what's done to one person, you know, I, I'll be honest, like being in the mode of, you know, reviewing songs like I do so much Mm -hmm. and, you know, listening to songs critically, I'll hear songs on albums that I think, yeah, that song wasn't done. That song, Mm -hmm. I have a bunch, I'll have notes for, you know, I'll listen through an album and I'll have notes for the songwriters afterwards. And so, I mean, I'm not going to give them those notes. I have them in my head. (laughs) You're right. Uh, like, hey, I just reviewed your album you just put out, everyone. Here you go. Right, right. It's too late for you, but this is what I would have done. <laughs> uh, not not super helpful. But all that to say is like it is, it is going to be subjective. But I mm-hmm. think the most important thing is does the song say what you want it to say? Right. And melodically speaking, do you have those distinctions between your sections? Do you mm-hmm. have like a high point and a low point? Like mm-hmm. that those are those sorts of things are really gonna help. But at the end of the day, it's better to put out it's better to put out a song than not put than to not put one out. Mm-hmm. And I think there's a lot of professional songwriters out there that uh, you know, have held on to songs that are just brilliant really great songs but they don't think they're done and so they've never they've never released them and it's probably not it's probably a lot of people that are listening to this right now so let me just tell tell those people put your songs out just put them out yeah like no matter what you put out three years later three years from now you're gonna look back and say oh man i'm I'm a better writer i wish i hadn't put that out (laughs) everybody does that that's part of it that just means you've grown don't You got to just put, if you're waiting, that inner critic is something we talk about a lot in the school because that inner critic kills you Mm -hmm. because it always changes the rules. You have to be this good. And then when you're that good, it's changed the bar. And like, well, now you have to be this good. And you got to just stop listening to that voice and just put your songs out because your songs are important. People need to hear your songs. And it's important for you as a songwriter to, to do something with the gift that God gave you. God yeah. gave you the the gift of songwriting, the ability to write because he wanted you to use it. He wants you to steward it. So put the songs out. Yeah. It's going to be That's okay. Good. That's good. Man, what is the most common problem that you run into as songwriters that you teach? Ooh, there's probably a couple. Uh, self-criticism is definitely a big one. Yeah. Um, and we spend a lot of time talking about it, as I said, in uh, – in uh, in our school because it mm-hmm. is such a it cripples you really is is mm-hmm. what it does and and I mentioned it earlier but your like your creative the creative parts of your brain aren't supposed like they don't actually function when you are uh, being critical because mm-hmm. you know basically what you're doing is you're stressing yourself out mm-hmm. when you are uh, when you're being critical uh, and the way that God designed the brain is so fascinating. Like I, if, if I wasn't a songwriter, I would go into like, you know, neuroscience <laughs> because it's, it's so fascinating what the brain does. Yeah. But when you are being critical, when you're criticizing what you're doing, you're actually releasing cortisol into mm-hmm. your body, which is the stress hormone. So what cortisol does is it actually triggers your fight or flight mechanism in your brain, which mm-hmm. is the part that, you know, when you're anxious, your fight or flight kicks in, which is why a lot of times when people are anxious, they can't sit still. It's because your body has pumped a bunch of adrenaline into your legs Mm -hmm. so that you're ready to run. Mm -hmm. So it's the part of your brain that is saying, you're not safe, Mm -hmm. get out before it's too late. Like that's in essence, that's what this whole thing is for. God didn't design it so that, you know, if you're walking through the woods and you see a bear, you know, your brain isn't thinking, let's sit down and write a song before the bear right. eats us. Right. It's saying, you got to move your legs. Right. Get out of here. You're in danger. Yeah. And so when we're being critical and we're criticizing what we're doing, not only are we not being good stewards of the gift that God gave us, like we're, we're not being grateful for what we have. We're just giving, you know, giving ourselves reasons why, why it's not good enough. Mm-hmm. But 
uh, we're also releasing that stress into our bodies and your brain actually isn't designed to function creatively mm. when your body is, when you're stressed out, when you're having cortisol. It actually uh, counteracts all of the feel good and the creative hormones that are happening like dopamine. Wow. It actually cancels those things out because wow. it says escape is priority. So huh. it's a it's a really fascinating thing, but I would say probably the biggest problem that that, that probably that feels like probably the best answer uh, mm -hmm. for that because mm -hmm. people criticize, they criticize, they criticize, and they wonder why they don't finish songs and they wonder yeah. you know why they can't get stuff figured out. It's like, well, here's the deal. This is what I tell people all the time. Writer's block is optional. Mm. It's it's you don't have to stay there. Uh, but here's also another true thing about writer's block is that it's self-inflicted. Wow. And that we think ourselves into a corner because there's always something to write about. We just like to limit the way that we write because we're trying to filter out bad ideas. But when you start filtering out ideas, you filter out bad ideas and good ideas at the same time. Wow. So that inner critic is not your friend. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So as someone who's written songs for mm -hmm. you know, years and has written, you know, on, on a higher level, as you know, teaches other people to write songs. What do you do personally to continually improve your songwriting and improve your craft? I mean, for me, teaching about songwriting has actually been, has been really helpful as well. Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, a, a way to really grow is to be writing with other writers uh, yeah. a lot as well. Co-writing is is such a big, such a big thing. A lot of songwriters don't like to co-write because they don't want to, you know, expose you know, some. For some people, they feel exposed. For other people, they're like, "This is my song. This is my baby. I don't want to have you know somebody else take a look at it because I'm afraid right. of what they're going to say." Right. But I think there's a lot of strength that. Uh, comes out of co-writing mm -hmm. uh, not only do you get you know can you get better songs but you can also uh you can also have you can learn about the way that other people write mm -hmm. and you can you can learn from them and that's a that's a big uh that's a big benefit yeah that's so, really good uh and just listening to music and listening to what other mm -hmm. people are doing and studying the way that you know how is it that people you know, how do they write? What are the, you know, the similes and the metaphors that they mm -hmm. use? Because that's a really, there's a whole art to, there's a big, a serious art to the metaphor. Mm -hmm. uh, and so studying other people's writing is another really great way to to keep your, your skills sharp. Yeah, that's good. Well, man, we are about out of time for tonight. But before we go, um, tell everybody a little bit about the Songwriters Advocate and you know, kind of what maybe what the school looks like a little bit and how they can connect with it, how they can get connected to you or anything else that you're doing. Yeah. Well, the Songwriters Advocate is an online songwriting school uh, for worship leaders and songwriters. We've had people come through who have been writing for years and years. Um, and we've had people who've taken the school who have never written a single song in their life before, which oh. I think is I think is awesome. Yeah. And so um, you know, it's a great way to kind of start yourself off right. Uh, we have two uh, two courses in the school: the 101 and the 201. Mm -hmm. uh, 201 is actually brand new. It just uh, we just finished uh, in the last. I think it was like I think it was ended in February. It was our oh, first. Wow. It was our first uh, first round. Uh, they are, the 101 is always six weeks. The 201, since it's brand new, uh, it was uh, six months, yeah. six month school. And, um, and there's still figuring, still figuring that one out if that's going to be six months in the future or six weeks. Sure. Uh, but the, basically the, the 101 focuses on uh, creativity uh, and, you know, how to write a better song, how to write you know, with consistency in your songs uh, 201 uh, focuses a little bit more on like the next steps, like, you know, storytelling and uh, writing personal worship songs versus corporate mm -hmm. worship songs, uh, mm -hmm. how to how to review other people's songs, mm -hmm. things like that. So it gets a little it's a little more uh, in depth 
But for people who are interested in learning more about the school, they can uh, follow us on uh, Instagram. Uh, it's just the Songwriters Advocate is our username. They can, they can also go to the songwritersadvocate.com to check the school out there. But like I said earlier, I think a great uh, like welcome to everything that the school does is to do this, uh, the songwritersadvocate.com slash five steps gotcha. and get that guide. Uh, and that will also uh, get them signed up for uh, – a, a weekly email that yeah. that uh, that I send out that is just it's like a two minute read with a quick digestible songwriting tip or creativity tip mm -hmm. uh, that you know it's just to keep people keep uh, keep people inspired. Awesome, so, yeah. Well, guys, go check that out. Connect with Matt and the Songwriters Advocate. Um, you will be better for it, Matt. Thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, happy to be here, man. Thanks for listening to the Worship Leader Coaching Podcast. For books, one-on-one -on -one coaching, and other resources, visit our website, worshipleader.me, or connect with us on Instagram at worshipleadercoaching. 